Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. Everyone checking in online, in person, and around the world. Welcome to the first ever State of Public Memory Monument Lab Summit. Please give a round of applause for yourselves for coming today. So this is the first ever, and we're very proud of that fact. And I am actually the vice chair of Monument Lab. So on behalf of myself, the board, our staff, our fellows, our creative partners, and everyone in the Monument Lab ecosystem, we warmly welcome you. We want you to share this space. We want you to engage in this important dialogue. And we hope that you take something away as we consider the state of public memory. I'd like to take a moment to do a land and labor acknowledgement. In the spirit of acknowledging those ancestors and elders, foremothers, forefathers, indigenous and enslaved persons who sacrificed, who paved the way for us all, we give honor and gratitude to those who continue to steward the land and raise the standards and do the work to be keepers of the culture. We are standing in Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, in proximity to both power and inequity, to transformation and injustice, and we critically reflect on the nuance and intersections of this. As we engage in remedy and repair, we want to honor the spaces that we occupy and the spaces we have the courage to resist against. We owe a debt of tears to so many who have built these spaces, who occupy these spaces, who subvert these spaces these spaces of municipal, academic, corporate, and civic. We honor the immense contributions for this state of public memory. So with that said, thinking about all that we're going to experience today, I wanted to ground us just a little before we kick off our conversation. The Regeneration Project, clap it up if you are part of the Regeneration team. Yes, yes, huge snaps and claps. Those fine folks coming from all over the country, Montgomery, Alabama, Tucson, Arizona, Los Angeles, California, St. Louis, Missouri, Queens, New York, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Cae, Puerto Rico, Rapid City, South Dakota, West Virginia, Denita, Four Corners region, each and every one of you, we are so happy that you are dignitaries and the highlight of this State of Public Memory Week. And tomorrow, for those who are online and in person, tomorrow at 12 o'clock, you are going to get to know each and every one of the teams and the creative projects they are birthing. So stay tuned for that. Follow us online, had to say it, at monument underscore lab. Join our mailing list, support this work. And tune in again tomorrow at 12 noon for the Regeneration Project preview. I wanna thank all of the collaborators and partners of this summit, especially the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the Open Societies Foundation, the Aspen Institute, the Center for Restorative History at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History, the National Park Service, the National Mall, and the memorials. All of our hosts, especially the Corcoran School of Art and Design at the George Washington University, we thank you. Let's give a round of applause for them. It's important that we remember that this is a dialogue and everyone's coming with a different perspective we welcome your perspective. So if you're online tuning in, please do comment in the chat. A member of our team will be responding and routing questions appropriately when the time comes. 
If you're in person, we also welcome your participation. Without any further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Lauren Anke, the director of the Corcoran School of Art and Design, and one of the fine hosts of the Monument Lab Summit to say a few words of welcome. Dr. Lauren. Thank you so much, Monica. Welcome, everybody. It is really thrilling to have you all here. Um, I am the director of the Corcoran School of the Arts and Design, and it is so exciting to have you doing your work uh, in this space. Um, like all of us, this space has been quiet for the last couple of years, and while we were open this year for classes, the building hadn't really been fully activated, but to see our students' work going up on the walls and video installations happening and to watch you do all your work is an incredible reminder of why we all do the work that we do. Um, it's been so important for us this year to get to know Paul Farber, who's the William Wilson Corcoran uh, Visiting Professor of Community Engagement, and that's given us as a school an entree to get to know the work of Monument Lab, which is so important to all the conversations and all the work that we have to do on the meaning of memory and power and history in our public art. So I uh, congratulate you for the work that you're doing and just hope that you're having a good time in our space and it's a productive and welcoming space to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, doctor. I also wanna welcome Monument Labs director, co-founder, the man of the hour, Dr. Paul Farber to come to the stage, along with Sue Mobley of Monument Lab, our research director, and the Mellon Foundation's Justin Garrett Moore to be in conversation, clap as they come. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Uh, and of course, so excited, so happy to be here with all of you, the region team, and uh, the World Monument Club that we're all in, in it, uh, and for those of you online as well. Um, and uh, thank you, Monica, for the introductions and setting uh, all of this up. Uh, so. Paul and Sue to kick off the conversation. Uh, probably a few years ago, probably weren't thinking you'd end up doing this with your life, being right here uh, with these challenging topics. So how did each of you get into this work around monuments, around public memory? Uh, maybe kick it off with Paul, since you had to sit in the middle. Okay. Uh, first of all, just want to express a lot of gratitude to you, Justin, um, to all of the Monument Lab team and the Regeneration team and, and for everyone who's watching us online trying to bridge the distance. Um, it's really a treat, it's an honor to be here and feeling that presence from so many people. You know, this is work that is, really feels like it's part of purpose um, I can try to tell you back a trajectory that I like knew from you know um, this this earlier moment, but I think you just have to follow the path that you find yourself on. Um, I've long been interested in history and memory, not as distinct but as blurred together. Um, get that from growing up in a Jewish household, um, from queer history. Um, and also the stories of this country that I have learned and had to contend with, and thinking about how all of that braids together. I think in many ways, I wanna just also acknowledge that teachers have really led that way. And I was thinking today, we're here just uh, not too far from the National Mall, um, and I was thinking about my first encounter with the mall was through the stories of my first and second grade teacher, Carol Corson, who was a white Quaker woman who attended the 1963 March on Washington um, for Jobs and Freedom. And she told us stories of that day, um, and in our class gave us a context to talk about this country and talk about how race and gender and class and 
so many other forms of identity and belonging are fundamental to our understanding of this country. And that, to me, stays with me. And I think of other teachers along the way um, who have paved that, who've opened up that possibility. Uh, it's so important, the uh, narratives, the stories, uh, and the impact that they have on us as individuals, but also in community, you know, your, your teacher, right? That's a connection uh, that you have with, with story, but connecting it to place, connecting it to your nation, uh, really, really powerful. Um, Sue? Wanting you echoing. Let's try that again. I get to cheat a little because my earliest teacher was my public history teacher because my dad taught subaltern history and he taught place-based subaltern history. So for most of my childhood, you could find me being dragged on extremely long walks around the city of New York um, talking about working class histories, talking about black and brown histories, talking about indigenous histories that lay under the streets or showed up in the architecture, um, but that were stories told in place that weren't stories told anywhere else. Um, and I have largely done place-based work in my career and in my free time and admittedly drag my child on long walks where we talk about history and place. <laughs> and I think that being part of that tradition of, of thinking about how we tell and who we tell and what a difference it is to, to stand in a place and to understand who stood there before you and to think about who will stand there long after you is very much a part of my understanding of not just what it meant to be, what it means to be a professional in the world or a creator or a storyteller, but what it means to be human. And I am mostly just trying to be more human. So powerful. Um, the, well, one that it's, I didn't know that, and it's just amazing uh, that you have this early uh, access to this work and, and, it, and that it carries through to the work that you're doing today and are transmitting uh, to the next generation and to, to all of us. Um, uh, brings us really to the next sort of thread, which is that memory work, uh, monuments, commemoration, public history is collaborative work, right? You're you both really mentioned kind of early, early stage collaborations with your teachers, with your loved ones. Um, and all of this work in, in some form needs to be collaborative in some way. So can you talk a little bit about how that aspect or dimension to the work is essential? Um, the, the collaboration of making memory, shaping memory, keeping memory. Yeah, you got this. You got this. Yeah. <laughs> I think we. Sorry. There's there's no way to hold memory singularly. I think that's one of the things that is inherently problematic about the historical and the process of making history. The idea that we can reduce a multitude of voices to a singular authoritarian voice and call that truth. So if we want to tell histories, if we want to understand things with the multiplicity of voices and understandings that any one of us holds from moment to moment, but certainly that we collectively hold, then we have to do that in collaboration. We have to do that together. And that work is hard because working in collaboration, working in community is difficult work. It's heart work but it's also thought work, work that comes with so much vulnerability to betrayal, to mistrust, 
to mistakes that fester, to egos that run amok, to our own uh, un inability or unwillingness to understand our limitations and our red lines, and to communicate them freely. Because in order to communicate them freely, we have to have trust. And trust is hard because it means being vulnerable. And so collaboration is both essential and the hardest thing to do. So important that trust is, uh, in, a, in a way, the material that we need to do this work. Um, and that takes different forms, different speeds, different relationships. Um, Paul, I'll, I'll connect it to you in that um, Monument Lab has obviously been structured around uh, not just collaboration, but setting up coalition. Uh, and that coalition work is challenging, uh, has many layers to it. Um, so what, what are some of the, the things that you've been learned or exploring in this process of coalition building? Yeah, to echo, as usual, what Sue's saying. Um, no, I, there is no place with a single story. There is no place with a single voice. There is no place with a single way to narrate that. And I think anytime you get a sense from someone protecting a single story, um, rather than creating space for many people's stories to coexist, many experiences, the layers of place, there's something to watch out for. And I think in that spirit of, of coalition, coalition doesn't have to be a permanent thing. It can be strategic, it can be tactical, it can be joyful, it can be difficult, but the idea is that you are figuring out a vision and a, and a set of values, and those that you cannot compromise, and those that you have to understand how to build. And I think that part of where we've seen this work, and this thing we'll keep echoing, is that it's a common, idea or misconception that there is some single authority out there that gathers all the information about the monuments. They're in charge of them. They'll figure out what's right, what's wrong, who belongs there, um, and, and all the information about it, right? Who paid for it? And, and then when there's a grievance, we should go to that body. And, and of course, for those organizers who have been doing amazing work for generations, they do know exactly who to push and who to nudge because they're reading the layers of the municipalities or institutions. But I, I say all that to say, for us, coalition means valuing multiple forms of knowledge. Knowledge does not just exist in the academy or in city government, but it exists between people. It means that collaboration has to have boundaries. You know, I think about the work um, in Monument Lab, our director of partnerships, Naima Murphy Salcedo, is so thoughtful in knitting together these kind of questions early on. What is our mutuality in the work that we do? And how do we recognize when our mutuality runs out? And, and I say that lovingly, right? So you can say, I want to cheer you on. I want to support you. I want to at least know what you're doing. And that way I can move forward. And I think, you know, there is something I want to have thoughts of, of, and, and um, understanding for folks who see monuments and memory as a zero-sum game. There has been such a dearth, a lack, a void of broad representation that it feels like we have to fight for every bit. And I think how the question for us in, in building coalition and working with artists and valuing artists' voice and sensing presence and absence is to understand how you expand the terms on and off the pedestal so that we're not narrowing in on one spot, but we're understanding how memory is working, again, on and off the pedestal. Yeah, the, the underlying frame is power, obviously, right? The coalition is a way that people are able to, to build their power or exercise their power, or make their power visible. Um, and ultimately, there, there's sort of a, a, a question about what is that power for? Who is it for? 
what is it for? Um, the, the reward of this work uh, across generations, across uh, places, uh, across experience is, is so important. So in the, in the work that you all have been doing in coalition and collaboration, what are some of the major rewards that you see that are motivating people and, and bringing a wider variety of people to this work that, that may not have had that power? Yeah, I, I, there's something that we've kind of seen over the last decade, which is that if you have the time, the money, and the official power, you build monuments that are important to you or reinforce your power. If you don't have the time, the money, or the official power, you have power nonetheless. So you build your own monuments or you gather around those that exist and that's how you amplify your presence. This is why Monument Lab you know, has, has put forward a definition of monument that is monuments are statements of power and presence in public. Whether you're working in bronze and granite, projection or poetry, or dealing with um, traces and absence. So, you know, I'm thinking about those joyous moments, and I think it's when we see artists, educators, storytellers claim their place as visionaries. You know, I'm thinking about Monument Lab fellow Free Bangura from, from Richmond, Virginia, who's here with us today, um, who has put forth the theory of commemorative justice and has worked to create spaces, not just around Richmond, but now around the world, to have people-powered commemoration. You know, I'm thinking about the stories of some of our regeneration teams, like Michelle Browder in Montgomery, Alabama, who despite state prohibitions and generations of um, whitewashed history, has said, you know what, I'm building my own monument. I'm creating my own curriculum. I'm gonna create spaces to navigate around the city. And so I think those breakthroughs, um, they're forms of reckoning, they're forms of truth telling, there's a lot of trauma and pain associated with them, but just seeing the joy in justice is profound and it's a way of animating learning and building across lines and legacies of difference but it really makes history come alive. Any, any addition there? No, he nailed that one. <laughs> well, great. Well, uh, obviously, uh, Monument Lab has been an incredible leader in this field, a partner, uh, and the Monument Audit uh, was a Herculean effort. <laughs> Let's call it that. Um, uh, almost uh, seven months since uh, the, the release of the audit, and I'm sure you all have been hearing a lot, processing a lot, um, and just curious to hear sort of where you are in, in, in processing so much information and in that major, major effort that you've done. So I think... <laughs> Um, wow, it's been seven months. Um, it feels both much, much longer and not nearly that long ago. Um, I feel like the, the process of creating the audit was so much like learning as we go, um, figuring out how to process it, figuring out where to find data, figuring out how to like create algorithms and examine what was out there. Um, garages. Garages. State of Connecticut, I need you to stop marking garages as historic. It's not, just, this, just this, stop. This is Sue's public service announcement. <laughs> Sorry for that. And, and sort of the fun part now, is that we get random questions. Um, so I man the research email, um, and people who have their own specific areas of like expertise or curiosity write in with these amazing like 
why don't all the statues of Mary in front of churches count? And I'm like, oh, I've been waiting for someone to ask that question for like seven months. <laughs> and now I get to write you a two-page email answering it. There's so much that we learn. There's so much um, hidden in the, the data set that's searchable and play withable that didn't that couldn't possibly have made it into the written audit. Um, it would have been encyclopedic. Uh, Lori and I would still be writing it. And it's fun having people explore that and find new things and sort of follow their own paths to finding what's important about the landscape. It's also fascinating seeing what we thought were going to be the big points, be points that people are like, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, first of all, just I think to extend that question of joy and struggle, I mean, just so much love to the team who there were 30 people working across the country who never were in the same room together on the hardest project they ever worked on to, to, to deal with you know, this something about monuments, which is they are central to our cities, towns, and regions, to our zeitgeist, and they're elusive. And they're elusive to track. You ever try to open up a, a drawer and you're gonna grab a power cord and then all of them come out? <laughs> so magnify that across over half a million records and close to 50,000 conventional monuments. And I just give so much love and appreciation to the full team whether they were designers, researchers, um, teachers who helped us think through it, of course, our partners at the Mellon Foundation who supported us throughout and gave us the room to learn. Um, and, and I think just to, to say it, it was really hard. It was the hardest project we worked on. It's a, a tight volume. We wanted it to be portable. We wanted it to get into classrooms and museums, which it has. We wanted to travel, which it has. We had to fight, find the right words. And it took everyone on the team from their own perspective of integrity to put their foot down and say, whether well, it's data due diligence, design, public engagement, we have to deliver that. And I'm, I'm very grateful for the joy at the end of it, but also aware that this tells us a lot about our cultural memory landscape, that it takes people to care for it. There is no monument that is permanent in of itself Someone's got to clean it. Someone had to plan the budget for it. Someone had to decide to keep it or not. And this was a reminder for us to feel that. I think just since the audits come out, it's been amazing to have it be there and have learned things that we didn't know. There's a bunch of stuff in there that you didn't need an audit to know. That the monument landscape is over dominated by symbols of white men. That war is the most common uh, feature of American monuments. But then you also go into that and you say, like when, we, when we realized of our study set that of Civil War monuments among nearly 50,000 conventional monuments that 1% mention slavery in the record. That means in the title, it means in the plaque, that might just mean in the metadata that some record keeper keeps, that's 1%. The Civil War was undoubtedly fought over slavery. There, in our top 50 list of most commemorated figures, there were more Confederates than black Americans. The work out of the audit has meant not, you know, to, to really have to respond to lies in the landscape. We talk about protecting history. We have to see history fully in order to protect it, in order to uplift it. And I think that has been eye-opening. Last thing I'll just say, it's been amazing to hear from people who utilize the audit as a tool. Got an email from the public art office in a, a city in Estonia who said, we also have a bunch of bronze dudes in our city. <laughs> And that was a great entry point, but then we, we talked a lot about what they learned, what they saw. Um, getting folks who are doing work in classrooms, like shout out to all the high school educators who've used our educator's guide made by high school teacher Rabia Kassam Clay, who created an educator's guide. So it's seeing it used as a tool and being excited for what comes next. There's like a new project from our friends at the 
the, the group, the Natural History Museum, who are taking on park names now. So we hope the audit has many cousins, siblings, and many generations that make it a snapshot of a monument landscape in the past, not just one that we're holding on to frozen. You know, really incredible, and we at the Mellon Foundation have heard a, a lot about monuments, of course, from all different corners of the nation and, and world, and then the audit has been really instrumental, I think, for people to have uh, a frame, a grounding of, of uh, sort of knowledge, of information uh, for this work. Uh, it's, it's a mirror essentially. Um, you know, we just did a trip for those of us who are here in D.C. to Lincoln Memorial and hearing about the layers of that place. The reflecting pool was, was uh, uh, drained, but the reflecting pool is America's mirror, right? It's, it's constantly seeing us. Uh, and this, this audit, this data, is a tool for us to, to see ourselves. So thank you, just <laughs> gratitude for that hard work because it is labor, it is work. Uh, I'm sure that you would have found, you and the team would have found things that are not comfortable to, to see and to process. So there's a kind of a labor there uh, that should be acknowledged. And for all of you that are engaged in this work, it's important to take a moment and acknowledge that it is hard work. It's really challenging work. There's pain, there's trauma, uh, there's loss, there's erasure. Uh, so just wanted to name that. Um, so maybe let's um, move on because we did hear some, some great connections and outcomes from the audit um, to region. Uh, so we have here in the, the room these wonderful uh, leaders, um, community members, just great humans uh, doing, doing work uh, on, on this topic. And so, um, you know, this is a way to kind of expand on the work that the, the audit was doing. So could you just outline a little bit for us the framing and thinking about region as it's connected to your, your larger work. So taking off my Monument Lab hat for a moment, um, long before I was director of research at Monument Lab, I was co-director of a project called Paper Monuments in New Orleans. And through an amazing set of very strange coincidences, um, just as a group of architects and artists and urban planners were thinking about what comes next for the spaces where four Confederate monuments had been removed, we were introduced at a lunch table in Minneapolis to Paul and Lori as friends of a friend who were doing something similar and had thought about some of the stuff we were going to have to think about. And so very graciously, um, Paul and Lori got on the phone that Friday with myself and Brian Lee for three and a half hours. <laughs> it's a good first date. It really is. <laughs> and talked us through what they had learned through the processes of building Monument Lab to that point. What mistakes there were that we didn't have to make, what really joyous breakthroughs we could build upon. And we had a partner and an ally and a sibling project to be in community with, which made a tremendous difference to how we approached our work. Paper monuments didn't end up looking exactly like Monument Labs 2017 labs. 
place is different, the community is different, the culture is different, the context is different. But it shared a lineage of learning and of growth that wouldn't have been possible without that connection. And so when we started thinking about how to understand, be in, and change the monument landscape across America, what we wanted to create was an exponential um, version of that, to bring 10 teams together to learn from each other, to learn from our experience, to be in community, and be a support to each other in developing projects that would go forward and hopefully recreate that experience with the next 10 and the next 10. And to know that that building of a community that doesn't have stakes for each other and has the space to just be in support, to be a family spread out, a listening ear when you need it, and a strategist when things get really tough is sometimes exactly what you need to understand your place, to have somebody from outside who can help you look at it differently. Yeah, I mean, regeneration is the biggest project that we've ever done, and we have big appetite for projects, if you know our team. And In insatiable, really. Yeah, well, I, you know, it's, just it, just the whole country, just that. Yeah. Well, and you know, it, it's been really inspiring to learn from this process, and really great to be working, co-directing with you, Sue, and also all of all of our team. And it kicks off May first, and it's not like another kind of exhibition that we've done. It's not that it's open and done. This is about the people who are inheriting, evolving, and innovating the monument landscape. And in order to do that and to echo what Sue is sharing, something we've learned over the years is that we want to honor and value local knowledge and expertise and build community and coalitions and strategy across locations. And so for those folks out there, you know, we know of, of layers of power and the status quo that sometimes make it hard to bring about change against the forces of status quo. But when someone in another city is like, oh, I'm checking for you, I, I respect it, sometimes that opens up something. And I know with us, while, while Sue's narration of this story, and it was the great Jessica Gars who brought us together, I love Jess. Yeah, shout out to Jess. Shout out to Jess. We all Monument love Lab. Jess. Yeah, she's Monument, <laughs> Monument Lab doula. Um, but um, you were getting our experiences from the past five years of work, and we were able to have a context for learning, a context for refinement. And I love my city of Philadelphia. And there's something about when these two brilliant people come from New Orleans that some of the naysayers or people who were not checking us out said, oh, now we have to check out for you. And that's a phenomenon I heard from a lot of artists and a lot of organizers around the country. They say, where's the love in my hometown? I'm getting the love from, plate, from people in other places. And I think we have to think about that. We have to, we have to support homegrown work and we can also build these coalitions. I, I think the other thing I would say with regeneration that's really important and I want to just encourage everybody if you can to attend the session tomorrow online at 12 noon eastern but just also look because it's really it's coming very soon it's going to be all summer wherever you are whether you're um, in one of the 10 cities Montgomery Alabama LA Matawan West Virginia Tucson Arizona St. Louis of course Philly um, and and others um, we get asked this question like what do we do with the monuments? Do we keep them all? Do we tear them all down? These like as if there are only one or two options and we have to get through the work quickly. When um, Monument Lab started with co-founder Ken Lum, with Lori Allen, with our team, in 2012, which was 10 years ago, we felt like our work was late. We already felt late because there already had been 
more than a generation of artists, activists, educators who had been calling attention to the fact that the symbols we have and the systems we've inherited are not accounting for a full history. And so that's been an approach we've had. And so for regeneration, if you, if you are out there and you're like, I, you work for a municipality or a museum, or you're wondering, well, what do we do with the monuments? Look what's already happening. These are 10 teams from around the country, but they are part of a much larger community that we wish could also be a part of regeneration, but they are, because this is a big movement. And I think part of what we wanna highlight is wherever you are, there's something brewing. There's movement, there's momentum against the forces that are out there. So how do you learn first, elevate first, try to find resources for that work, because our artists and educators need those resources, and then build something bigger? Yes. Yeah, ab absolutely. This is building a field. Uh, that is is needed to see this this transformation in our commemorative landscape in in the U.S. Um, and I'm sure it would have been difficult to sort of curate or or kind of navigate like what the the seeds were exactly in in different places with different stories. Um, how, how was that process for you, and, and what do you kind of learn about the, our nation, right, in that process? Sue, will you tell us about <laughs> your love languages, procedural justice? Ooh, procedural justice. The process by which we make a decision, and our understanding of that process from the door, and our buy-in to the process is as critical as the decision at the end of the process. And so in selecting teams, we did an open call um, for regeneration. We had 240 applications. We did a rapid fire up down we did close reads by five of our team members that ranked along five different measures. And none of them were hierarchical. They were, has creativity needs greater analysis. They were, the community connection needs work. They were, the, the technical capacity needs work. And it let us look at things in terms of strengths and weaknesses and to think about what it would mean to commit resources of money, of time, of expertise to envision strengthening any of those project types and to then think about, you know, what. What does 10 look like as a cohort? We narrowed, and then I subjected our staff to a staff meeting that made everyone cry, where they had to knock some out. There's multiple kinds of tears. There were multiple clear. kinds of tears. Everybody got to have one project that it would break their heart if we cut it. And everybody got to have one project that they were willing to see go by the wayside. A project that would break someone's heart needed two waysides to go away. And so I spent a lot of time processing everybody's <laughs> feedbacks and getting everybody's secret notes of no, but really, my heart will break. You can't. Heart work. Heart work. <laughs> and then we put a list in front of a jury. Um, and the jury read through your project descriptions. 
um, got links through to everything that was submitted, and they had to make some decisions. And that, too, involved quite a bit of crying. <laughs> I mean, there's a few things to say. One, um, appreciating that Sue led a very thoughtful process, and there was a lot of heartbreak around it, just to be very clear. And something that we don't often get to say, but there was a lot of folks who unfortunately were not able to be a part of regeneration, but this involved some um, matchmaking on the edges. So following up, like we budgeted staff time to follow up with as many people as we could to strategize with them. Sometimes it was an amazing project, um, it wasn't the right fit for this moment, but like we sent them to someone that we know elsewhere. Um, and I think it's really important to note while we are like the regeneration cohort is a remarkable group. They're part of a much bigger movement of folks. And if you're at home listening um, that, you know, or in the room listening, um, we just want you to know that and keep doing your work. There were also some people that we were like, oh, they're bigger than this project. They have um, they other, are ready to go. They may have other <laughs> access to different institutional funding. Um, and I think there's something very particular about this group, which has been um, curated through the open call, subgranted a total of a million dollars, a hundred thousand dollars per team, that said, at this point in time, in this way, this is what I can do with this. Here is my vision for it. And just hearing from folks, especially one of the criteria you did mention, Sue, was on our mind is are there other sources of funding for this work? And in many cases, we were watching people who have, were, were pulling themselves and their teams toward finding that reach. And I think it's really important to say, and again, you know, Monument Lab is, it sounds very official. Monument and lab sound very heavy. We've been around before we had a monument, before we had a lab, and we're not a foundation. We are a group of artists and curators who have a value of when we grow, we want our people to grow, and we think about that very intentionally. So we hope for folks out there, you know, seeing the landmark work of Mellon's Monuments Project and other important work out there, like, if you're, if you're looking to support meaningfully this work, there's the regeneration teams, and there's so many people out there who can really help animate history for us in new ways, and we just look what already is happening. That's a key. It's already happening. The answers are already here. The pathways are already here, and we want to cultivate that. Yeah, I, I love that, and especially hearing, you know, the process matters. We talk about social equity, social justice, inclusion, you know, all the, bur the buzzwords, um, but it's, it's work ultimately. <laughs> um, there may be some tears, it sounds like, um, but, it's, but it's important to acknowledge that part of the work or that the, the work that people are doing in their communities isn't always the thing, right? It's probably easier to say, you know, raise money to build the thing, but maybe not the systems, the people, the relationships, right? Those, those are equally a part of the landscape and, and the infrastructure. So it's really important to kind of acknowledge and name that as well. Um, you mentioned people had their like the, the heartbreak. Um, connected to the heartbreak is hope. Um, and so what were some of the hopes maybe for uh, uh, these projects that were selected, and maybe if there's a little bit of a preview that you can give us for uh, what what we've been seeing in the, the realization of some of these hopes. Yeah. For everyone out there, I want you to think about just you have a few days before regeneration kicks off, and you'll be able to get a sense of what's happening across the country. I mentioned some of the places I want to shout out more, like um, Calle Puerto Rico, Rapid City, South Dakota, uh, Dineta in the, what is we call now the Four Corners region, um, and all around. So one of the things you can do is try to find events 
whether in the places that you live or the places you're going to travel to this summer, you have a road trip ahead of you. Um, a sneak peek to we're going to be putting out a special regeneration map that's a learning tool um, through monumentlab.com in the next coming days. And we want you to go visit those places. If there's ways to engage it online, which there definitely will be, we want you to be able to tune in. Um, and we want everyone to be a part of an accompanying project as kind of our counterpoint to our own audit, uh, public uh, stories postcard project, where we're working with the Smithsonian's Restorative History Center on asking this question that's at the core of regeneration. What stories belong in public? We know it's a multitude of stories. And you, as I ask that question, I want you all to think about that. What is a story that belongs in public? Is it there? Is it missing? Is it part of something that's hard to put a pin on a map on? And we wanna be as complex and as clear as possible that monuments must change and the people who are doing the work of changing monuments, who are fulfilling a grander vision for democracy and protecting the vulnerability of democracy are doing it through regeneration and they're doing it now and they're gonna keep doing it beyond the project too. I think that the idea of, of hope as the other side of heartbreak was so apparent in the process that people's projects that their hearts would break if they didn't see, realize, were also the projects that they were like, because this story is my story, or is my mother's story, my grandmother's story, is a story I've never seen told in public, but a story I know, because it's mine. And the hope of finding each other in our stories, the hope of telling such a plurality of stories that everyone can see themselves reflected in their own communities and across communities and can find the ability to hold a multitude, to be a democracy that holds a multitude, is something that we will also have to build and rebuild because it is the work of generations. But we have such incredible partners in that building. Yeah, it's the the multitude is is a term we we pick up a lot. Um, it, it it's sort of a different framing from our diversity, right? That kind of has the ability to kind of put into to different parts. But there's the the idea that there's all of us, all of us matter. Our stories matter. Our experiences matter. Um, is is quite powerful. Um, clearly, we're we seem in the waves and arcs of time to be in a moment. These past couple of years, whether you've wanted that or not, or <laughs> we're participating or not, we're in a moment. Um, and commemoration, monuments, all of these things seem to be in a, a, a particular time of transition. Um, sets of conversations, direct actions, making themselves present in lots of strange <laughs> and very tangible ways um, that, that we've seen here in DC and all over the world. Um, so, you know, public memory, commemoration, it's, it's taking on a, a sort of a scale that we haven't seen in a, in a long time. What, what do you have to say about doing work in this time, in this moment? Is this the time to shift power? Right? Is, you know, let's, let, let's get it going, right? What, what's your, your framing and urgency of working now? <laughs> we have no choice but to shift power in this moment because if we are not working to shift power 
the shift that is happening around us will kill us all. We have a heating planet. We have a stumbling democracy. We have a global rise in fascism. We are all going to have to fight against that from whatever ground we stand on, with whatever tools we have, with whatever talent and capacity we bring, because that is the fight of our times, whether we wanted it or not. It is simply what is. What Sue said, <laughs> as always, you know, something that we've been talking about is that in a way, we're going through like this renaissance of monument reckoning and reimagining at the same time that repressive forces across the country are mobilizing and organizing against the telling of full history, of, of accurate history. The kind of prohibitions that are coming up in public school systems and will be pressuring other kind of institutions um, are pernicious, they're toxic, but they are designed to erase signs of struggle and to consolidate the single story in place. They're also happening at the same time of a resurgence of anti-democratic measures to, pro to prohibit, to bar, to make challenging the right to vote. And this is the moment that we find ourselves. This is a, a contradiction. How do we find more and more opportunities and platforms to have our artists and our truth tellers speak truth to power and a moment where we desperately need them? And I think if anything, what I wanna make sure that we see is that urgency and love and purpose in why we are doing this work. This is not neutral work. This is not objective work. It's work that's responding to erasure and lies. And I can say that with a lot of love, but I think about the work of my teachers, of my students, of my colleagues, of my collaborators, accomplices, and the importance of speaking truth to power. And the time is now. We can't put this off another generation. Because if we do that, as Sue noted, we endanger our very survival. Last thing I would just say, because we're here very close to the National Mall, and I think a lot about something I've learned from this place and I've seen elsewhere, which is um, something we've, we, we call urgent mourning, where the activity to mourn a loved one, a friend, is not separate from advocacy. There is not the luxury of separation. So whether it's the legacy of the civil rights movement, of AIDS activism, of the work of March for Our Lives, I just think about how urgent memory is making your grief known, not because you wanted to, but because you have to fight for respect, dignity, and your own survival. And I think that's the moment that we're in. We're not in a different moment. We're in a moment where for those who we know we love and those who we have the capacity to love more, we have to make space for grief and utilize all of the tools we have, any joy that we can conjure, and any of the possibility to remind that we need another way to bring the past with us forward. I, I love that. What are the other ways? Um, we've, we've seen for a long time a pretty narrow set of ways and for a pretty narrow set of people. Um, but trying to do the work of setting some new patterns, uh, showing some new possibilities is, is quite key. Um, for those that are joining online, you're welcome to start entering some questions in the chat. Also, for those of you here in the audience, you can 
uh, be thinking of some questions. Uh, we'll uh, pivot to you soon. Um, I do have uh, a couple already uh, streaming. Interesting one. Um, what is the role that shame plays in, in our monuments? <laughs> Is it reckoning? Is it? Um... I'm going to try to answer it and try to, it might not be what the person is looking for, but I really appreciate the question because it's part of a full spectrum of emotions that are as much a part of history as they are politics. And, you know, sometimes we get asked this question of like, well, what's the difference between a monument and a memorial? And there are many classrooms um, and, and other kind of spaces that I would love people to debate those. But one of the things that we often say is that, okay, well, textbook monument is supposed to be about what you value and what you, what you uplift, and a memorial is where you mourn. And when I see something, whether it's called a monument or memorial, you know, I think about um, our co-founder Ken Lum has often said this, anytime you see a site of memory, you also can view what's being suppressed. And so, Everywhere that we're looking, there's a site of memory, of course, on this continent, which is full of broken treaties and stolen land, there's shame everywhere. There's been bloodshed everywhere. Have there been stories of survival and belonging and stewardship? Yep, but they go alongside us not being of our word. If, if this country is founded on a vision and a principle and we can't be of our word, what can we be? So we have to recognize that. You know, I've spent a lot of time in Germany. It was not my vision in Hebrew school growing up to do so. But I, I, when someone says don't go somewhere, which was often the prohibition because of the way that Germany was a part of Jewish trauma, I got pulled there. And it was actually both the stories of German Jews over history, but also other folks in solidarity who in a place of profound pain charted the greatest transformation. It's a place now of, of reimagining, of encountered stories of Afro-German people and of, of um, folks who are um, you know, considered quote unquote guest workers, though they're several generations deep um, from Turkey and elsewhere. In Germany, they talk a lot about shame. There are memorials that are big as city blocks and some others that are small like a cobblestone. In addition to the public memory landscape, there have been reparations, financial reparations programs for Jewish families and others whose money was plundered and taken from them. There are school curricula that are a part of this. And I'm not saying that that is some utopia. They have a heavy historical burden, but what you see is not one technique or tool. So shame is one technique or tool, and it's there whether we're gonna call it there or not. So how do we make space for it because I think if we make more space for whether it's shame or grief or loss, we're going to also make room for acknowledgement, commemoration, and processing, and doing the work of healing. I have, it will surprise no one who knows me to know, three different trains of thought going about this. <laughs> At least. At least. At least. Okay, so one of them is that shame and what is shameful is um, contextualized within culture. And so without sort of a shared understanding of what should cause shame or what is shameful, we sort of can't envision how it's enacted um, or enforce how it's enacted. But of course, the monument landscape tries to do precisely that. Um, and specifically, it tries to do that through re-scripting. And so you get Confederate memorials into monuments that erase the shame of loss. 3% of Confederate monuments, by the way, mentioned that the uh, Confederates lost, which is still more than mentioned slavery. And <laughs> That's right. 
but they re-script that loss into a victory and then they assert that victory through policy and practice to shape a culture ahead that admits of no shame. The construction of the period of intense construction of the pioneer monument is also the construction of the pioneer narrative in books and comics and movies and TV shows that paint the conquering of the Wild West as a trope of victory over an empty land and erase everyone who occupied that land and was shoved off of it. That's the refusal of shame. And then I think about the fact that we expected people to react to the percentage of violence in the monument landscape, in the audit, and certainly we reacted to it. Um, Greta, Gabriel, and I spent a weekend coding all of the violence, um, and then we had to go lie down for a while, because it was a lot. It's a lot. But no one has engaged with that in talking about the audit. It is the lacuna in response. And I think that that is because acknowledging how violent would of necessity require feeling shame. And so it cannot be engaged because that's so uncomfortable that we have to find a way to blow past it. I just wanna riff on that and whether, whether we acknowledge it or not, we're bursting at the seams as a country, pushing the full history, trying to push it, but it, we, can't, we can't hide from it. We can't elude it, it's there. And I, I just, I, I, I think that, you know, we know that history does not take the form of a statue. Statues are not facts on a pedestal. You don't hear the folks who say, what about history when we bulldoze black neighborhoods? Where, there's history there. So history doesn't just live on a pedestal in that way. And just think about how many communities we've seen appreciate history in moments of reckoning when there is room for grief, for shame, for acknowledgement. And there's a lot of room for it. And the more that we resist it, we will burst at the seams. And so how do we recognize the opportunity, the healing that is on our fingertips and not push it away, but create spaces for the national crises of grief and loss, of anti-democratic measures that need a lot more of our attention, right? And I think that it's not a question of, are we gonna look at monuments and symbols or systems? They're tips of the iceberg. And they are places where we can organize, where we can grieve, where we can rally, where we can amplify. And that's meaningful, and they're not the answer alone. That's great. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's, I mean, it, it's one of those like short, but, deep questions that, that um, I, th I think all of us can maybe sit with for, for a little bit. Um, shifting gears a little bit, I'll, one more online question and then I'll, I'll go to the audience to see if there are any. Um, this is for Paul. Uh, so you spoke briefly about how queer history fits into the pi uh, picture of memory preservation. Uh, could you speak more about that history and how you see it? fitting into uh, America's commemorative landscape? I'm a queer person. Um, I came up in a generation um, that overlapped with, but just came after the devastation of the AIDS pandemic. And the opportunity to have intergenerational exchange of knowledge and experience was devastated. And it can't be, you know, overstated. 
Um, we're here, again, as we say, we're here by the mall, a site of the AIDS quilt, but also of a place where, in that spirit of urgent mourning, um, countless LGBTQ plus people um, said, in lieu of a funeral, I want my friends to cast my ashes on the White House lawn for a president that took years to even mention the crisis of tens of thousands of mostly gay men dying of AIDS-related causes. So it came up when I was young um, with whispers and trying to access a full story. And it was really through the work of artists and poets, Keith Haring, David Vonarovich. I think a lot about the poet Essex Hemphill, um, who's a black queer poet between DC and Philly. And um, he has been kind of a, a, an important muse in this. And he, in, in writing a poem that was actually critical of the AIDS quilt, he said, it's too soon to make monuments. And what he said is that if, if it, it's too soon, because he was thinking about, oh, you know, I need to memorialize. He used the poetic form to do it. He said, we need to know what is killing us and who is trying to have us die. And that was um, an important voice to understand. And so I think with queer history, as an approach, you're dealing with gaps, you're dealing with losses, you're dealing with the challenge of what is not there, but you're also looking at the work of artists and collectives who said, let's get people to make a zine. Let's bring uh, the, the, the joy that we can muster up and put it into our protest. And I think that's the kind of legacy of memory that I've interpreted, inherited, and tried to make sense of. I love hearing that um, link between the importance and value and role of artists uh, in, in all of this work. Obviously, Monument Lab is deeply connected to um, the, the power that, that art brings to, to these conversations and you know the intersections with, with the LGBTQ plus community and, and the arts obviously has a very long and deep history, but sort of acknowledging that, that value and, and, you know, the ability to critique with love, right, to push us to other expressions, um, to question the boundaries is, is so important um, in this work. Um, so, for those of you here in the room, do we have any questions? I have to play like, uh, what, Sally, Jesse, or, okay. <laughs> Thank you, I'm Kimberly Prabolis. I'm a senior research analyst at the Southern Poverty Law Center, and I work on their Whose Heritage Project, which maps and tracks data on Confederate monuments and memorials. Um, and I'm wondering what you say to people who do not believe in facts and history. So I can show you a primary <laughs> document where Jefferson Davis says that the Civil War was fought over slavery, but this is not convincing to a lot of people. So I'm wondering when you encourage that, or in, encounter it rather, what, what is your reaction? Depends on the day, <laughs> how much coffee I've had. You know, I think one of the things, so I spent a lot of time with a lot of neo-Confederates in my city. I spent a lot of time with a lot of really angry people pointing guns at me. And I do not like it. But I also know um, that they are, on the whole, 
for the moment, a relatively small portion of the population. And so when we started work on the Confederate Streets Renaming Project in New Orleans, one of the things that we made really clear to the sponsoring council members and to the team for the panel of experts is that we're gonna ignore the edges and go after the 80% of people in the middle who we can build with. I also know that spending a lot of time on the like, why this person is bad or why what you were taught is wrong is often counterproductive because if we, we push, we get pushed back. And so a lot of what we designed in our process for the Confederate Streets, for Paper Monuments, a lot of what Monument Lab does in our various projects in various ways is to create spaces where people can come in and speak their truth because often once they've had the opportunity to say it, they're a little bit more willing to listen to somebody else's. Um, but more often, what they want is that moment of conflict. And you can spend so much time and energy giving them what they want, or you can deny them what they want, which is personally satisfying, <laughs> and keep on moving to the people that you can teach and that you can bring on board. So how do we get Jefferson Davis's appallingly honest statements in more hands younger so we're not having to counter teach? How do we ensure that that access and that willingness to engage is there um, as broadly as possible so that we're not having to do that work? And you know, first of all, thank you, Kimberly, for your question, all your work. And if, if you have not read the Southern Poverty Law Center's Whose Heritage reports and data, please check that out. It's been that kind of study that uh, people have at their fingertips and they're able to utilize in different ways. You know, I think uh, we have a lot of self-proclaimed history buffs in this country. Um, no self-proclaimed or few self-proclaimed um, history amnesiacs. But we have a lot of amnesia and selective memory. And I think Sue's great point is figuring out where does the energy go for our limited energy, nonetheless pushing and vibrant, to figure out where you put that energy. And you know, I imagine there are some days where you've had the, you've eaten your bowl of Wheaties, you've had the ability to say, I'm gonna take this on. But I think to Sue's point, figuring out what is, sometimes people say they're just talking about history, but they're talking about a whole lot of other things. And I think putting the energy on organizing against repressive anti-history bills is a great way to put that focus there. I think the idea of reaching um, learners of many ages and getting them that information. And I would say something that, that we've learned is, like, just to say there are people out there who want the history whitewashed, do not want to account for actually what the founding documents say, not just the stuff in the margins or in their minds, like, they just won't read it, right? We come from a history and we've inherited of broken treaties and of compromises that have bent language. I'm also very interested in the folks who are very comfortable in the status quo. And I wanna invite you to the party. We welcome you at any point. There is work big and small to do. But I'm also aware of the folks who say, yes, definitely, this is important work but what do we do with the monuments that we have to keep? And I'm like, listen, you could worry about that, if, but also let's worry about all these other things that come with it, right? The fact that in our top 50 um, list of most individuals who recorded monuments, there are more Confederates than black Americans. I wanna get your outrage there at the top 50. Number one was Joan of Arc. I want, your, I want you to put that there and again, figure out in big and small ways every single day, bear witness, figure out where your energy goes, and try to be a part of something bigger to make generational change. Thank you. One, so one more. Thank you. <laughs> this mic is so awkward. 
Hi. Thank you. Um, so my question, I'm really interested in how you were talking about so much organizing. Oh, okay. So much organizing uh, in terms of this work, like cultural organizing. And one of the things you said that monuments are often created through this kind of time power and like organizational power, right, and money. But in terms of grassroots, I think monuments can be built through organized time, money, and people. So I'm curious with this cohort that you've created, if there's any strategic thinking in the long term about how these sites that are being made can be used to gen generate ongoing money, time, and power. How can people show up around them? How can people continuously? If people come to West Virginia to see a monument, right? They're bringing money into that space or in Richmond to a specific neighborhood. So how are we anchoring that money and space in the long term to organize? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kate. From Studio 23 in Richmond, Virginia. So one of the things you say is go look up Studio 23 in Richmond, Virginia, which has been a space to generate exactly the things that you're talking about. And we get to learn from you and the country gets to learn from you in the tactics that you've used fundamentally by creating the tools, the spaces, and the ways of thinking. So just much gratitude. And again, if you don't follow them and support their work, wherever you are, please do so, Studio 23. I think there's different ways to go about that, right? And I think about the regeneration projects and you know, I think about the work of the team from Los Angeles, Land Under the Plinth, which on space that was formerly occupied by colonial monuments, a Tongva-led indigenous um, group is trying to build a cultural center and ways of marking the larger area of what is now called Los Angeles. And that's about building capacity, power, space, and it includes some close collaboration with the city of Los Angeles through cultural easements and that persistence and reminder of accountability, right? I think of the work of one of the team members, Yoel Garcia, who is also a former Monument Lab fellow, who um, referred to themselves lovingly as a pebble in the shoe of municipal government. And this is a person who's been um, an organizer and also an artist in residence with the city. And so to think about the Land Under the Plinth project in LA as part of that. You know, I think about the Mothers of Gynecology monument and, and center in Montgomery, Alabama, led by Michelle Browder, who is here, who has for years been running more than tours. So when people come to Montgomery, Alabama, a city that defines itself as a birthplace of the civil rights movement and a cradle of the Confederacy in the same sentence, that on the blocks with one block away is EJI, Equal Justice Initiative, another block away is the home of Southern Poverty Law Center, on land that she has cultivated with her family has created a space that you get to understand the stories that aren't always put in bronze and marble. And so for her work, she's made her own monument against prohibitions in the state to take down pernicious symbols. She's been honoring um, a group of, of women who were um, part of the, this terrible history of um, medicine, so-called, um, for innovations in the field of gynecology, but done at the expense of enslaved black women, and honored them through a monument, and is also making a curriculum, and is also creating spaces for young people and intergenerational audiences to gather. Those are just two examples. And I think part of what we would love for people to see is ask those questions, kind of do the mapping in your hometown. Maybe you're a place that doesn't have a lot of time or money, but you have a community space and kitchen that you're willing to open up for memory workers. Maybe you're at a foundation and you're thinking like, oh, I, I wanna support, I've been asked to support, what could I do? So there, there's a role for everybody and you, you go from the land that you're on and you work with the tools that you have. Also, that was an excellent tease on two of our teams and everybody should check out the public. Uh, <laughs> you 
I don't remember what the phrase was that we used to describe it. Um, the public presentations from the Regen teams tomorrow oh, afternoon. Because that's two of 10, and we could keep going and going. Right. Yeah. And they'll just do it themselves tomorrow. Well, that is a great note to wrap up on. Um, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Sue. Thank you for audience and uh, those joining via Zoom and, and especially for these great questions. I think the prompt about what are we doing in terms of coalition, in terms of resources, in terms of different ways of doing this work is so important. And we're really excited to see what all of the region teams will be doing and what all of you in, in this community uh, of people interested in focuses on and working through uh, these challenging issues with monuments and commemoration uh, can bring. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Justin.